How do we know this is the biggest Guardians offseason of our lifetime? Because it's the one directly in front of us. Welcome to the Selby is Godcast. I'm TJ. That's Zach Meisel. Zach, can you recall an offseason we ever said, eh, whatever happens, happens? <laughs> Just let it ride. Oh. Uh, maybe like 2010. <laughs> I, I don't even. What what was happening going into the 2010 offseason? season? Trying to think like those those years where it was pretty bleak. I mean, we I don't know that we even knew each other then, but when it was pretty bleak and Manny Acta was the new manager and there seemed to be no direction. But that would wouldn't that still make it a big off season for establishing the direction of the franchise? I guess. I'm uh, sure. Well, so then what? Go, I don't, you answer your going, own question. Going into that off season, I'm sure we said this is big because you want to establish where you're going heading into the 2010s, putting the 2000s to rest. I think in the moment everything seems massive, but it even trying to take that into account, given where this team finished, coming up sh- sh- short in the ALCS against the team that's now in the World Series and trying their best to win it. Because of the fan base and their their connection to this club in particular. Because there are now going to be expectations on this team where there were not expectations before. Not just with the players, but a first-year manager too. We we say glowing things about Stephen Vogt, but the, the longer we get into his managerial career, it's going to be less about he connects with his players and that's the only thing that, that matters. We're going to get more into picking apart his managing because he has the experience now. He needs to be able to to be better in a moment. So I think because of all of that and, and things that we haven't even touched on yet, it makes this a massive offseason that really was going to establish the direction of where this team goes the rest of this decade. Yeah, I guess I would characterize it as it's it's I don't really know like where to go. I don't, I don't usually the blueprint is simple. It's it's straightforward. You know, all those years when they were winning the division title under Terry Francona and it it just felt like all right, you got to add a hitter. You need the right-handed power bat or you need um a first baseman to replace Carlos Santana. Like it was it was pretty simple what they needed to add and it was a matter of are they going to spend enough money to land someone consequential or are they going to make a trade or are they just going to try to patch it together i feel like in recent years it's been similar like last year we knew they needed a couple bats zanino and josh bell were your answers didn't work okay this year i it's very cloudy to me they need stuff they need help it seems like they. I mean, they they need starting pitching help for the first time in years. What? The Cleveland Guardians. They need stuff. <laughs> just put it on. Label the off season. I just can't remember a time where they needed, and not just like, hey, they need a number five starter to round out the rotation that you can just pick up someone on a non roster invite in spring training and do it that way like they need legitimate help in the rotation and they need more help in the lineup and it feels like they have a lot of holes and yet you know you can there's some depth in certain spots and there's some really intriguing prospects obviously that you don't want to bank on but who could be part of the equation at some point it's just I guess my point is like it's yeah it feels like a massive offseason because I'm not quite sure yet what the blueprint should be and obviously, they're never going to show us what the blueprint is. Usually, it's pretty easy to figure out. And I'm having trouble doing that now. And and it's rare to have this sort of feeling for a team that just made the Final Four of baseball, right? Like, <laughs> the way I'm describing this, you would think that they went like 75 and 87. And there's some hope, but, you know, certainly things wouldn't have ended up the way they did. You know what I think we're doing in this moment? You in particular. I think you're guilty of this. Something that I'm very guilty of. Let's say I have to... I'm thinking... Today I have to organize the attic. I've got to clean up 
the downstairs portion of the house. I've got to clean out the garage. And what I get guilty of is I think, oh my God, I got so much to do. Where do I even start? How do I even begin to approach this? And it becomes way too massive. It becomes a weight on your shoulders. You don't even know what, how do I begin? What do you, what do you need to do is get the momentum rolling. And you start with just one thing. It's just one simple thing. Let's tackle that. And I'm very guilty of, oh, this thing over here. Oh, that thing over here. And it takes away my attention, but I need to focus on picking apart one thing at a time. Let's attack it with some sort of checklist. And that's one what thing. I think this team needs to do. I don't know why. Do. Doesn't it doesn't even matter, even matter how hard how you try. Hard you try. <laughs> let's, let's attack this with some sense of picking this apart one by one. Because it would be a massive thought to, how do I make sure this team makes its next step? How do I maintain this momentum? And if you just think about it that way, that's too much. So I think today, Zach, we should approach this as what are the top 10 things that need to be addressed, the biggest questions for this club? And I think if you establish what, the, what those questions are, then you can begin to attack them one by one. What do you think? I don't like it. You forced me into this. And <laughs> the, the thing that I don't like about your stance on that's this... That's how the is show goes. <laughs> that's how the show goes. <laughs> Zach saying, I don't like it. You forced me into it. Welcome to the Selvius Godcast. <laughs> when you're building a roster and you're concocting your offseason plan, one move influences the next. Doesn't it? Especially yes, this team. That where I'm... Isn't, isn't that why you want to establish what the, the big things are? Because then you can rank the order of importance or how, what has to come first before we can get to question four. We got to tackle question two. I just think if you're going to trade Josh Naylor, you better have a move to get another bona fide hitter in here. And so you have Ooh. to, I feel like you can't do one without the other. Okay. Would, okay. So would you say that's one of the biggest questions of this off season? Would sure. That, if, if I was saying, Zach, give me first on this list. What is it? How does Josh Naylor fit into the team's plans? That's how I would phrase it. He has one year of team control remaining. You could let him play that out and then walk in free agency. You could try to sign him to an extension. You could let him play out the last season and then try to re-sign him. You could trade him. How do you determine what the right move is? What are your other needs? What are your contingencies if he's not on the roster where's his value what could he get what does he deserve in an extension right now I have no idea what he would want it sure sounded the way he talked early in the year when he was hyping up Stephen Kwan and kind of giving hints that the team should have signed him to a contract extension remember all that like he was dropping those hints in post-game press conferences and almost seemed like he wanted one too you know, what What would he get in free agency a year from now? Like, there's so many questions surrounding him, and I really don't know what his future holds, which sort of leads me to think just let him play out the last year. But part of it, and this is what I was getting at before, is that's a big piece that connects to a lot of other pieces. If you're trading him, are you trading him to get something useful on your major league roster, are you trading him for a pitcher that can help you? Is that more valuable to you than he is? <clears throat> are you confident Kyle Manzardo can step in and carry that load? Do you have other hitters who can hit in the middle of the order? I don't know. I feel like it's one question, but it's a lot of sub-questions. We could probably even break this apart further. You know, if you trade him, what is the thing that you're looking for that it makes sense, that it would actually make you better? Is it that picture that you're talking about? As we talked about really extensively on the, the latest Patreon show, patreon.com slash Selby is Godcast, get over there. There are scenarios where it could make some sense, but I don't think those opportunities are going to be presented. I, I just don't think you're going to find somebody that makes you either better or at least the same costing less money. I just don't think that, that that's going to exist for all the reasons why first base DHs aren't valued. And I, I think Naylor is a, a great player to have. 
at this stage in his career. I know the postseason looked rough. We all expected more from him. I'm sure he expected more from himself. In fact, if he didn't expect more from himself, then I would question what's going on internally. Uh, Seeing that guy, seeing the way he reacts, I'm pretty sure that he wanted more for himself. All that said, he's a this team, that sort of player, you need that guy. Let's say he's a 20% above league average bat. This team needs that offense. Before we can even start about how you make this offense better, you don't take away the guy that's 20% above league average because then that's another thing that you need to fix. Now, establishing all of that, I'm also not sure that he's a guy that I want to be committed to beyond the end of 25, which is why I think letting this play out is the best course of action. Even if he has a great year, I don't think he should be outside your price range. If you just, if you think to yourself, this is a guy that we want beyond 25. He comes back and has another 30-bomb year, but this time he does it with a little bit more consistent averages to go along with it. So he's closer to like a 130, 135 WRC+. Plus. Or he's even more of the guy we saw earlier in the season. Comes back and proves that he can just be healthy and not banged up. All these questions, I think, could be answered with just a little bit more data. And in this case, data is just letting 25 play out. Then I'll have more information on all the guys that could replace him. Manzardo, Fry, anybody else, Noel, anybody else that comes up from the minor leagues because we weren't thinking of John Kenzie Noel as being a guy going into last offseason. Now he looks like a guy that could be a, a contributor. So there probably is going to be somebody that emerges that we don't even think about right now. Let me have more information. And in, in, in so many cases, it's like, well, if you let that play out, the guy will walk and you're not going to get him back. I, I don't know, Zach. I just feel like that sort of skill set should be within their price range, even if he goes out and has another good year and you want to commit to him at that point. I know they won 92 games and they reached the ALCS, but do we agree their roster needs to improve? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You have to convince me then that trading Josh Naylor will somehow result in an improved roster. And i that's where I struggle. How are you getting better by removing him from your lineup? Because you're right. You're not going to get like... It makes no sense to trade him for prospects. Okay? Because what? how is that helping you? You're not... This is not the time to make that sort of trade. So if you're flipping him to a team that has a pitching surplus that needs a first baseman, maybe that works. I just don't think you're going to get a top-end starting pitcher for him. I feel like you have already a lot of back-end guys or guys with a ton of risk associated with them, talking about McKenzie and Williams and Allen and Lively and Cantillo and whoever else. Um, So... You know, if you could if you could predict the future and you knew, well, we're going to flip Naylor for something else useful and then we're going to trade prospects for Brent Rooker, then that that suffices. Brent Rooker is a better hitter. He's probably a DH. Naylor might be a DH too. Brent Rooker has three years of team control. There you go. But as I was saying earlier, one move necessitates another, but you there's no guarantee. Like unless you can somehow time that up to do it the same exact day, like you don't know that you're going to be able to pull all these levers at the right time. That's what makes it so tricky. Like I, I, so I, I don't know. Um, Naylor's a tricky one. I, I, I know they don't typically like to just let guys play out the string, but. You know, the Bieber thing, like they would have traded him, but he got injured before the 2023 deadline. And then obviously he he had Tommy Tommy John surgery this year. So, and they wanted him to try to rebuild his value going into 2024. And it seemed like he was on the path to doing that. So I think they would have traded Bieber. The timing just never worked out. And now he's a free agent. With Naylor, it's a little different. You know, you're, there's just, it's a limited opportunity on what you could recoup in a trade. So I, I don't think they would be fretting if he just played it out here and then walked in free agency and signed a three-year, $45 million deal somewhere. I don't know. So it's just you're going to have a hard time selling me that subtracting 20% above league average is the best way to start the offseason of how do I get better. Right. How are you getting better? How are you improving the roster? It's not not impossible. 
And before I completely ripped them to shreds, I would let some degree of the offseason play it out because I would hope you have a plan for how you're going to replace that and build upon that. But I am skeptical that that scenario exists today. And I just want more information on the guys that could replace him before I would want to anoint somebody the heir apparent at any position and just believe that Kyle Manzardo would take off. And the guy we saw at the end of the year is just the guy he's going to be forever and he's going to seamlessly slide in. But, like, best-case scenario next year, he is the the offensive player that Josh Naylor was this past year. Mm -hmm. Like, just total overall offensive value. And then that's great, and he's making less money, and you control him for longer. And perhaps that opens the door for somebody else at DH. Still a lot of of, of maybes and might be's and hoping in this scenario for a guy to just be what you already had and you still need to build upon that. What if Manzardo is just a league average bat? Or what if he just doesn't look like the guy that he was in September? Not that I'm saying that that's what I believe, but I'm. <laughs> we've all seen enough baseball to realize not everyone pans out the way that we think. So that's why I just... I would rather go into the 20, between the 25 and 26 season, knowing more about the guys that could replace him. Then I say, do I want Naylor around? Do I believe in the guys that could replace him? Then I have a much clearer idea of what I want to do. There are a lot of, there are a bunch of uh, highly touted prospects. Your Delauders, your Bazanas, your Chorios. Ralphie Velasquez. Like, this lineup could look really good in a few years. And I think you want to extend, you know, by that time, obviously, like, Jose Ramirez might be smack dab in the middle of his decline, right? Um, you know, who knows if Stephen Kwan will be here beyond another couple of years. So I, I think you want to sort of bridge that gap as much as you can. You, know, you only have Lane Thomas under control for one more year too. So how can you get from one point to the other without cratering in the middle? You know, it's it's all we always say it. You don't want to just bank on a prospect coming up and filling a role. You want them to have to force their way in to really earn it. So, you know, when you're thinking like, ooh, but they could have DeLauder, he could play right field, and then Noel can replace Naylor at DH, and it's like yeah, maybe, but why just bank on the uncertainty when, oh no, you might have multiple good hitters in the middle of your lineup. Like it's, it's okay to, to have too much talent. It's okay to, <laughs> yeah. To, you don't just have to move every asset you have just because that's the way you're wired. Yeah, good good scenario here is we have too many hitters, not enough at bats. What are we gonna do? I like that rather than. How do we squeeze every ounce of goodness out of every ounce of our roster? Yep. Uh, much different place to be. All right, let's take this into a more positive direction for the first one that came to mind for me. Again, this is biggest questions for the team, and I also think for individuals as well, and it's the guy that's going to be the ace of this club moving forward, Tanner Bybee. How do you make sure that you're the guy that was closer to what you were doing against the Yankees in Game 5 compared to the guy that was earlier in the postseason getting pulled out early in games. How do you take that next st step forward to not only be the ace because you're just the best guy in a group of unproven guys, you're the ace because they can't wait to get you that ball. And I think Bybee has the internals to get there. I think he's got the drive and the bulldog to want to get better. But it's not just about going to the weight room and saying, I want to be better and like lifting <laughs> and and thinking, I want to throw harder. What's the game plan for him? And I think that's where the organization comes into this too. You know, what what pitches do you need to be refining? What do you need to be adjusting? Whether it's tilt on a breaking ball, whether it's trying to make a secondary better, whether it's working on an off speed. Do you want to continue to integrate the two seam sinker, whatever, you know, integration that is? Do you want to continue to build on that to make it part of your repertoire so that hitters have another thing to think about? What What is the next step forward for him? Is it just maintaining a healthier velocity? I don't know what that question is right now, but I think the organization, I'm sure, has some sort of roadmap for him to go into the offseason. And a lot of the times we see these players take it into their own hands, uh, whether it's a trip to driveline or something similar or, or, or just working in the lab tirelessly to 
to work on that secondary so that when they come to camp and they can display this new shiny thing that we all get excited about, there was a lot of, of runway to get there. And so I'm curious what that's going to be for him. Him taking that step forward to not only just be the best guy on this team, but one of the best guys in baseball is a necessary step for this team to elevate itself realistically to where those other three teams were being among the final four. You know what my message would have been to him if I was Stephen Vogt, Carl Willis, Chris Antonetti at the end of the year, those exit interviews, and I would have said, Tanner, here's the plan. I want you to go back to California. I want you to rent a cabana on a beach. <laughs> and I want you to just sit there and relax and don't move until early February. <laughs> That's it. Rest. Recover. We'll figure out the pitch, pitch, pitch mix, the sequencing, the refining your secondary stuff, whatever. We'll figure that out. Let all of the analysts we have pouring over all the data from the year, examining how you use pitches as the year went on, we'll figure all that out for you. You'll come to spring training. We'll see what feels right. Rest. In 2022, his first professional season, he logged 132 innings in the minors. 2023, between the minors and majors, he went up to 147. Sorry, 157. 157. And this year, playoffs included, he was up to 189. Now, he would tell you, you know, out of the... 31 starts he made in the regular season and the three starts he made in the playoffs. Was it three? Four starts he made in the playoffs? Um, he'd tell you, of those 35 starts, he wanted to stay in longer in probably at least 34 of them. So 189 innings could have been, if he was in charge, like 260 innings. But I would think the plan is rest. He's never pitched this deep into the calendar before because they are going to need him. Like, He's got to be that horse, and he wants to be. He's built to be. He's That's the mindset he's always had. It's great. And I think next year's the year. The manager and the pitcher know each other, understand each other, trust each other. I think what he did on short rest against the Yankees was very admir admirable. And I think you're counting on him next year to throw 190 in the regular season, and then you hope a bunch more in the playoffs. So I would say it's exhale. Like the, the minute details. Yeah, those are important and you'll figure those out, but he can, he can think about that stuff on the beach. If he wants, you know, maybe a couple pina coladas, get the brain going and make you start thinking about different ways to use your curveball. I don't know, but <laughs> I, the I biggest thing until he comes in, he comes in with some off-season meeting, and he's got this napkin. <laughs> it's like smudged <laughs> because, you know, it was the napkin where his drink sat, so there was a little moisture on there. But he's got an idea for pitching. I swear it's here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I just he's the one certainty in that rotation next season. They need him healthy. They need him rested. They need him ready to tackle a full season. And that would be first – First and foremost on my mind is is just recovery for him. And then get better. Find find a way. That leads me into the next question on the list, though. And I don't want it to be as because we don't need to spend 30 minutes on each question. I I don't want to say it's as vague as how do you fix the rotation? But I think there's a point of what do they need to do with the rotation for you to feel comfortable with the people they have? As it stands right now, you've got Tanner Bybee and then you've got this collection of question marks. So how many new faces do they need? Who in that batch of question marks are you confident can be a part of the rotation next season? And what what level of potential do they need? 
Does this have to be the strength of the team? We're, we were so accustomed to it year in and year out for a decade where this seems foreign. Like, is it okay if it's still the weak point? Is it okay if you go into the season thinking like, eh, like there's a lot of boom or bust potential here. We came into 2024 thinking, my God, Bieber, a healthy Bieber, a healthy McKenzie, Bybee and Williams in year two, Logan Allen in year two. Like that group could be, we said like top five if they stayed healthy. Well, that didn't happen. So what do they need to do to make you feel confident that it won't be a drawback to the team or that it could be the strength even? Yeah, it's this kind of goes along with the the thought that you had looking at the attic that needed fixed. There's a lot that we need to do here, and part of it is deciding what what resources do you have? What can you contribute to guys that are already here? Like Boyd, like is Cobb uh, a a guy that you would want to keep around? Is he a guy that? is exactly the sort of pitcher you need because there is so much question tied to his health. So he puts you into, into the price range that you could afford, but that's also someone that could be occupying resources and you don't know if you can trust him. You don't know if he can stay healthy for an entire season. I mean, you're talking to a guy in his late thirties. I know pitchers can, can stay there longer than hitters often can, but it's, it's a giant question. Uh, you know, did Boyd price you out of, of the price range just by how well he pitched once he got here? Does that matter? Because he's comfortable here. And so if you you just get close enough, he's going to want to take that from you because he liked everything about this situation and he likes where this the direction this team is headed. All the reasons why he decided he wanted to sign here. Does that stick with him? Um, those are, are two big questions that I think could help you decide. You know, if you could hold on to one of those guys, not that you'd you don't want to make other moves based on bringing one of them back. But it certainly would help the rest settle in a little bit more comfortably if you could just settle one additional spot to go with Bybee. And then I guess Lively is sort of in the conversation. I mean, how do you not give him innings next year based on the way that he pitched? He's finished sub-4 ERA for all the, the reasons why we talked about we didn't know if that was believable, and the team kind of indicated they didn't know if it was believable too because he didn't pitch much in the postseason either. But that's a guy that you know, you got to, at the beginning of the season, give an opportunity to, to continue to hold on to that spot. And then Gavin Williams. Having one additional spot settled, don't you think that would make everybody calm down a little bit? If you could feel like one of those guys is going to slide in and maintain a spot, and then the rest you can figure out from here. Yeah, they just need stability. So I almost feel like they need to sign somebody. A veteran. Maybe Boyd. Maybe not. Like, re-signing Bieber isn't the solution here. Like, sure, great yeah. luxury to have. But he's not going to help you until July. <laughs> and you don't, you can't bank on getting anything useful for him this season. You hope. He hopes. I think Boyd... Showed you their own map, but that's a risk. They need some low-risk, right. <laughs> decent-reward outcomes here. So I think a free agent, and I think there's got to be a trade. This problem isn't magically going away. Mm -mm. You can't rely on Tristan McKenzie. You can't rely on Logan Allen. Those are bonuses. I think you can rely a little more on Gavin Williams than those guys. But there's risk there, too. Joey Cantillo, again, interesting, risky. So I, I just, you need stability. I think you're missing like two of the top three starters or two of the most reliable three starters on a staff. And then again, like my Mailer, question, it's like, oh, if Williams and McKenzie rebound and pan out, it's like, oh, no, we have too much starting pitching. What are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. 
one of those guys seamlessly slides into the bullpen. Multiple guys seamlessly slide into the bullpen. But that's part of this. You can't... I like the bullpen depth. You know, even if certain guys take a step back, I actually think they have reinforcements to, to help them there. But you can't just assume... You can't survive 162 the way they did this year. 162 plus. You know, well, why, it worked why really we well this year. It? You just you can't go into a season assuming it's going to work again. That's why we talked about it because it was you, you. That's something you can't rely on. It. They just continued to defy the odds all the way to the moment that they finally showed some some weaknesses in the armor. And so we talked about it every single week because it was unbelievable that they were able to emerge unscathed. So much relying on the bullpen as much as they did. You got to take some off of them because you can't expect all of them to come out with one ERAs again. And, and well, I'll, I'll save that for later. My next question, and this relates some to the, the pitching staff too, what does the coaching staff look like? And not just in names. You, know, you want to find out, is Carl Willis coming back? Is he fully committed to another season? You hope that's the case, but you, you don't know. Obviously, on the hitting side now, there are going to be some adjustments. But even beyond that, you know, Stephen Vogt, this was his first year in the dugout, so he relied a lot on the, the structure that was already in place because he didn't know. He, he doesn't know how he best operates, and certainly they brought in his own guy, who you don't even know is going to be here, and, and Albernaz. Uh, but they brought in his own guy to help him feel more acclimated, but also rely a lot on the guys that were already here. Some marriage between the two, and it worked out well. But now Stephen Vogt has a year under his belt. He knows where do we, where did we commit too much resource? Where where were we lacking? What do I think would be a you know what what small little adjustments could we make in that coaching staff? Whether it's jobs people are doing or some something that's not addressed that we need to do a better job of going into this year. I think Stephen Vogt knows his machine and how it could be better function, but better functioned in 2025. And so I think there's some degree of that too. What does the coaching staff look like? The names, but also what is everybody doing to make sure that you build on all the good that was there in 2024? I, I can't answer that question because vote knows a lot that he wouldn't reveal necessarily about his coaching staff in terms of what they, what they were missing but I think that's something this organization needs to figure out. You know, what, what do we build on? What can we improve on? Yeah, so I will start by saying that you never would have known this. This was a lot of new faces on the coaching staff. I thought they coalesced quickly. And I, look, I'm not studying other coaching staffs throughout the season, but I'd find it hard to believe that there were many staffs more prepared than this one um it was incredible like watching if you just i would do this a lot i would like stand in a spot where i could see like the clubhouse the hallway outside of the manager's office and clubhouse out to the dugout and watching coaches go back and forth holding scouting reports and looking to meet with, well, let's meet with the catchers and then let's go meet with the pitching group and then let's meet with the relievers and then let's go meet. And like the, the relaying of information was incredible. And as all this is going on, you know, Kai Correa is working with all the infielders and JT McGuire is hitting fly balls to the outfielders. And this stuff is happening daily. You're seeing daily practices that in a lot of seasons in the past, you'd see like, you know, this guy made three errors last night, so he's out getting early infield practice. No, it's going to be everybody every day. Um, the preparedness was incredible. I thought everybody played certain roles and knew what their strengths were and knew what their responsibilities were. And, you know, there's a lot of people behind the scenes. I just, like, the public would never know. I wrote about some of them. I mean, I wrote, like, Craig Albernaz was Steven Vogt's right-hand man, and, and more than that, like, they challenge each other. They know each other really well. They know how each other thinks. They go all the way back almost 15 years in the Tampa organization. So, um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if Albernaz winds up managing the Marlins here. Um, but, and and then they'd have to, to recalibrate. And, you know, Carl Willis, who knows? Like, he could retire. He thought about it last year. Um, or he could come back and still be the 
like the architect of their pitching plans. Um, they obviously need a new hitting coach. So I think to answer your question, the interesting thing to me is, you know, Stephen Vogt came aboard and, and inherited a bunch of holdovers, hired some of his guys, and they had to sort of mesh, and they did. But what happens now? Now he has the chance to shape the staff the way he's envisioned it. You know, if he needs uh, he needs a new hitting coach, he, maybe he's going to need a new pitching coach. Maybe he's going to need a new bench coach, though Albernaz obviously would have been his top choice for that anyway. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens from here um, and just finding people who can sort of continue their preparedness. Because the biggest thing is, you know, you're going into this season and obviously Vogt had no idea like what, you know, he spent a year as the Mariners bullpen coach. So you get a little bit of a glimpse into like the day in, day out goings on and, and how to best lead and prepare. Um, but it's not like you can make drastic changes mid season. It's every day. You don't have a chance to really step back, but after a full year you do, you know, they can make changes to the way they operate and, you know, responsibilities being divvied up. So there's a lot that can change, I guess, going from year one to year two. I don't know. I mean, I, from the outside looking in, it seemed like they had a really good thing going on, but with some new people on board and, and a off season to think about things, it'll be interesting to see if it looks any different in year two. Yeah, to their credit, they've done such a great job of when somebody leaves, somebody else seamlessly slides in, whether it's internally or finding the right guy externally. I mean, what what are they on the hitting side? Do they feel like do they just promote from within now because they've built this structure and they just move everybody up, or do they look externally there? That'd be that'd be fascinating. But you know, we talked about this. I think even during the season, I think we're always constantly thinking of, well, if this hitting thing doesn't go well, they're going to replace the guy. We were having a conversation about vote and his, his career that he's had having the sort of career that vote has, hasn't he built a connection with somebody, some hitting savant that he would want to bring in to be his hitting guy to head that staff. I mean, I've seen people wish for Kevin Seitzer who the Braves dismissed at the end of the season, who I think he's 62 years old. He's been a really good hitting coach. And Vote played for him in 2021, but he's played for a lot of guys. He's played for a lot of guys for a longer period of time than the he was healthy with Atlanta for like a month um, that season. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, I can't give you a list because he's crossed paths with so many people over the years, and he, he probably has a list for various positions of who he would dream of hiring. So maybe that happens. Maybe they go internal. Like Junior Batances is essentially like the Ruben Niebla of hitting in this organization where super well-respected, has been in the organization for a long time, um, has filled a number of different roles, and maybe like Niebla did, he finally gets a major league opportunity. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, some hitters swear by him. Jose Ramirez picks him in the home run derby to throw to him for a reason. So I don't know if he'll get a chance or if they'll go external, you know, maybe it like, are there again, are there, do they need to fill a bench coach spot? Like there's, there's a lot of moving parts here. Yeah. Well, obviously a lot of that stuff will be figured out in the coming weeks. Guys are going to get their new jobs. They'll move on. Then you'll have a clear indication but I think you not only do we does this organization have the right man in place in Stephen Vote to to lead this and trust guys, but also because of the career he had, he has so many connections. Sort of the same thing with with Terry Francona when he first got here. He's just like he's been around the game so much. He is going to know if he doesn't already have a relationship with somebody, he's going to know somebody who has a relationship with the person in question, <laughs> and they're going to be able to talk. Uh, on the same level here, not no BS involved. No, oh yeah, yeah, he was great. There's gonna be a voter. This this dude's awesome. Or oh, Stephen, you got to stay the hell away from that guy. 
either way, I just feel like he's going to have a better indication of who not only he would trust in that position, but just who who's going to do a good job. And maybe he has seen that along the way, similar to his growth, thinking someday he was going to be a manager, running in circles with other players that maybe look like they were going to be coaches someday. Maybe he's already had conversations with somebody that he thinks would be great in that role. Yeah. I mean, along those lines, like I'm just wondering, like, who, who would Terry Francona's bench coach be in Cincinnati? And it's just, does it feel like it has to be Mike Sarbaugh? Are we just waiting for hmm. Mike Sarbaugh to just <laughs> hop over to Cincinnati and take over that role after a year as third base coach in New York? I don't know. Um, all right, I've got a question for you. What position Podbean. are you? That's where they can find us, Podbean. What position are you telling Andre Jimenez to prepare to play in 2025? Oh, that question. Ugh. God, this got complicated, didn't it? Are we overly complicating it? Are we thinking too much about a maybe in Bazana showing up in some point at some point in 2025? Is is that uh, just expecting way too much from a guy that was just drafted this past year? Yes, number one overall. Yes, has immense talent that we all can't wait to see up here. But do you make moves for your 2025 group with the anticipation that this kid is going to somehow jump up two levels and be here? And you have to make preparations for that now? Do you look at what Brian Rocchio did in the postseason and put more stock into that than the entire 162 games that you saw before that? Did you see enough growth in the 162 before that? that you think he's so young, he's going to take an additional step forward here. So I'm not going to take the position away from him starting in 2025. And it feels like, Zach, you know, if you would have asked me at any given point this, this season, I would have had a different answer for you. Right now, I think if it were me, I would be open and honest with, with Jimenez and say, we want you to prepare as the second baseman. But do not be surprised at some point if we call on you to be the shortstop. Well, that would be my best way. That would be my best preparation for him. That's the thing is like, odds are this isn't just going to be a clean break. Like you're not just going to have him switch to shortstop to start a new season, right? Like he, it, this is probably Bazana's probably going to come up at, for the first time in the middle of a season. And he's also probably the only guy who can force Jimenez off second base. So doesn't he need to be prepared to play shortstop at all times anyway? Like, yeah, there's a chance Bazana debuts in 2025. I don't know how likely it is. Um, whether it's 2025 or 2026, though, like, it's probably going to, there's, odds are it's going to happen in May or June and not on March 27th. And so... He's going to have to make a switch at some point. I, yeah, I, I... Is there any world where they trade Jimenez? Whether it's this winter or next winter? Sure. Sure, I think there's a world where it happens, but... At, at that point, you'd be selling very low. The... the, the, the only benefit you truly get in this situation, because I don't think you're going to get immense talent back you would just say well that frees up money and a position mm. like I, I i feel like that's silly like what if rokio the hitter we saw in the postseason that's just him now what if he has a great year at the plate and you've got pisana ready for an opportunity what are you doing I still need more information. What is everybody else doing on the club? And I know that doesn't seem to be linked, but it absolutely does. What if nobody in right field has stepped up yet? And you just have a spot on this team for a bat to, to plug in. Don't you just say, how do I make that work? If Bazana's raking and Rokio's good 
And Jimenez has just kind of been being what he is, just the savant defensively and, you know, just offensively okay. If you have another spot on the team where you just have an open spot, even if it doesn't make sense, to, can't Bazana for half a year, for two months, go play an outfield spot? Aren't you preparing him to do that? Because I think I would be doing that. I just think we're getting way too ahead of ourselves yeah, to be sure. thinking of, let's... Let's move Jimenez off of off of second base right now to prepare for a guy that we don't even know that we're going to see in 2025. Of course. I, it's more just, I'm kind of tired of the whole Jimenez defensive dilemma. Just be prepared to play both. At some point, you might have to make the switch. Just be ready for it. If yeah. it happens midseason, well, I'm sorry, but it might happen. I mean, Mookie Betts just picks up shortstop, right. goes play second base, plays right field, and this is an MVP caliber player every single year. Andre Jimenez, with his talent, can't do that. Yeah. And also, the other thing that I think is important, because these guys have egos, you're asking Jimenez, in this case, to move up the defensive spectrum. We trust you so much that we want you to go play the position that you first arrived here to be. Exactly. You don't think he wants to do that the same way a guy would say, oh, you want to take me from left field to center field? Because you think I'm good enough to go play there? I like that challenge. That's a good one. As opposed to, hey, Andres, uh, shortstop, you know, that we, we want you to move to second base, actually, or third base. And we know this is a position you've played for your entire life. We want you to move down the defensive spectrum for this young kid you know nothing about. I, j I just feel like m moving this way, he would take that as a challenge and as an appropriate one, one that he would like. Yeah, I agree. And if it happens midseason, it happens midseason. Like it, it's, and he's also not, you know, if if he had a, if he was able to replicate the twenty twenty two season at the plate, maybe he should have more power to dictate where he plays defensively and when. But that hasn't happened, so they have to fit in who they can to try to maximize the offensive potential of this team too. So he's going to have to shift at some point if they feel like Pizana elevates the team offensively. That's just, sorry. You know, you can, you can be a platinum glove defender, but with an 80 WRC plus, it's like, that. that's why they drafted Pizana. That's why, you know, they need more offense. That's why they need to figure out if Rokio is the guy. So... It's it's on one hand it's like an interesting conundrum and on the other it's just I'm kind of tired of it just you I'm confident yeah. you can handle both. Yeah, I'm, I know how much you hate it, but this shit fixes itself. It will how this plays out on the field will dictate what you need to do instead of thinking in advance. And I think we're guilty of this at times too. You know, when they drafted Bazan, I both of us looked at this this situation it was now is like. Don't you have to eventually move him to shortstop? Let's just make the move. But now, you know, we also benefit with the the information of what happened in the postseason, the rest of the season. In the postseason, you saw some growth from Rokio. I want I don't want to just then rip that away and say, never again. I think it's easy. In this case, it's easier to just let that play out with him at shortstop, see what carries over, what doesn't, and then by, you know, halfway through May, you're going to have a pretty clear indication of what what Rokio took away positively, what he still is, what he can be. You'll just have much more information to make a more informed decision. You'll know what Bazana's doing. Hell, you know what some other guys down in the minor leagues have done. Maybe somebody else forces Jimenez over to, to shortstop. You know, so I, I just feel like go into the season, but just be honest. And say that this could change at some point. Be ready for that. And w why we say vote is a great guy to have in place because he can win his players over for a difficult conversation. Because uh, we're being honest with you. This is what we're going to do. Be prepared for that. And we're doing it because we think it, it, it makes us a better team for you to make this move. I, I don't think we're probably making it way more difficult than it needs to be. Teams just deal with this crap as it happens. John Kensi Noel goes and picks up an outfielder's glove because... He knows that's how he's going to get his bat into the lineup, right. even if he's not what you would consider to be a right fielder. You just do it because that's what the team needs in that given moment. I, mean, I watched Tyler Freeman play center field in Oakland. 
<laughs> on opening day. <laughs> right. Right. You just do what you need to do. So in the interest of full transparency, we're actually working ahead on these episodes because Zach's going to need some time off in the weeks ahead. He's about to become a second time dad. And we recognize a quiet house is going to be tough to come by. And he's got other responsibilities. So this is part one of this chat that we had. Part two is coming up in a week. So hopefully you'll be here for that. Be sure to keep it locked here to YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for hanging out with us, everybody.